Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Cindy Cope, and Nancy Varvel and I have put this series of talks together about four years ago. One of his, Don's good friends is Doug Talamay at the University of Delaware, and he wrote the book, Bringing Nature Home, and it changed my life. Oh, and that's what we'd like to do is change everybody else's life <laughs> and show you why we need the native plants. And we're, they're good. We need them for our survival. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Don Steinkraus, professor of entomology at the University of Arkansas. Wow, welcome. It's nice to see all of you here. Uh, I am not an expert on this. I'm interested in it. So, um, but I'm interested in Fayetteville, and I really like bugs and birds. So my title is The Effect of Non-Native Plants and Birds on Birds and Insects in Fayetteville and What You Can Do About It. I tend to put a lot of slides in because I'm very photographic oriented, so I'll try to go through these fairly rapidly. I always start out with a picture, I like to anyway, of the whole Earth. Uh, just as an interesting thing, you know, it's the only planet in the universe we know that has life on it. There is absolutely no proof from any astronomer that any other planet has life. If it does, it's way too far away for us to mess around with it. Everything that ever happened in human history happened on the sphere. Every whale, every bug, every bee, every human, everything happened here and is still happening here. It's the only place in the universe we know about like this. And it's actually amazingly rich in life, uh, what we haven't damaged. Um, okay, uh, it's pretty clear mankind is having a drastic effect on the Earth. Uh, just some facts. This is out of Doug Tallamy's book. Uh, approximately 37,000 square miles of the U.S. is currently paved. That's five times the area of New Jersey. Uh, another 62,000 square miles of the U.S. is in lawns. That's as large as New York State. And then I want to show some slides about monocultures. I've actually spent most of my career working in cotton, so I know quite a bit about these crops. Um, this is just some, some old slides. These are actually not terribly current. It's pretty much accurate. There's about 70 million acres of soybeans in the United States. And this is all up in the Midwest and then down along the Mississippi. That's a lot of acres of soybean monoculture. And there's about 80 million acres of corn all through the Midwest and then scattered around the rest of the U.S. Uh, these are major monocultures, um, important to feed the world and us. I've worked primarily in cotton. There's 14 million acres of cotton in the U.S. There's a lot in Arkansas, Texas, all through the South and California. Um, and I've actually seen a big change in these things uh, during the 20 years I've worked in these crops. Uh, this is just a picture of Arkansas corn um, done in Little River County. Now these never were great sites for wildlife. I mean, these vast acreages of corn weren't fantastic for much, but they did produce a lot of corn earworms, which is a big noctuid that fed a lot of bats and a lot of birds. Uh, they're producing less and less because entomologists like myself spend their careers trying to figure out how to prevent them from having anything in the corn except for corn. The farmers want 100% of the crop, but when you take 80 million acres and it produces nothing but corn, that's hard on wildlife. Um, Arkansas soybean is the same thing. Most of these plants have been now genetically altered, so they're herbicide tolerant, so you can spray over these fields and kill all the weeds that are present. So you have these vast, true monocultures that produce very little uh, for wildlife. And grain sorghum, I've worked in that. Uh, that used to produce a lot of, of noctuid moths that fed birds and bats. Um, and uh, cotton. Cotton also used to produce a lot of moths. Uh, that was one of the big pests of cotton was moths, but then BT cotton has largely eliminated these noctuid moths. So what we have are vast acreages, which are monocultures. They don't even have weeds in them. And so they produce nothing but the crop, which is reasonably good for the farmer, but very bad for wildlife when you consider the gigantic acreages of these crops. Um, just some examples of corn ear when there's that same corn field. Uh, when I first started working here, every single ear of corn down in Little River County produced a corn earworm moth. You could find an earworm moth in every one practically, and at night the sky would be full of these moths. You might think, well, who cares? But this actually is very important for a number of uh, birds and animals. Um, now just some little things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but habitat loss is, of course, one of the most important things which is threatening our animals. And, and I would put monoculture in that habitat loss and paving over our, our land and putting everything in lawns. Those are all habitat loss for wildlife. But um, you know, there's report after report of this. I don't want to belabor the point, but Iowa uh, shows that you know, the prairie is largely gone, put into soybeans and corn. 
Um, there's a lot of reports about honeybees declining now. I mean, there's a lot in the news about that, and there are honeybee declines, and we could talk about that, but um, uh, there's a lot of reasons for honeybee declines. But um, things like bumblebees are, are at risk um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, there's, people are trying to study it now. Why are bumblebees uh, declining? And uh, one reason is, in like England and places like this, is uh, the haymaking, the changes in uh, agronomic practices result in less habitat for bumblebees. And I'll show you some pictures of bumblebees in a few minutes. Some of the reasons why pollinators, honeybees, bumblebees, and butterflies and birds are declining is certainly habitat loss through development. Uh, pesticides are, are, and herbicides are a major factor. Um, climate change, I'm not so sure about. Large-scale monoculture, agriculture, like I showed you, the corn and soybeans and wheat and cotton, almonds. I think excessive areas of lawns are a big factor. And then um, humans are way too neat. We have a great lack of substrate and refuges for the resting stages of insects and animals. And um, we plant a lot of plants, which provide no food for insects. Uh, and then also a lot of people are, don't like insects uh, and are against them. But now there's some pictures of, of Arkansas itself. Does anybody recognize that spot? Where is that? Fiesta Square. I use this like in pollination talks because uh, actually if you figure that there's, um, what they say, five times the area of New Jersey is paved. That's a lot of area. Even in Fayetteville, there's a lot of paved areas. And uh, if you look at that, there is nothing there for anything. It doesn't have to be that way. They could put median strips in there and plant some shrubs and plants for birds and wildlife, couldn't they? But they don't, they don't plant anything. It's just solid, wasted area. There's not a bee that can survive there. Uh, there's no birds that can survive there. It's not a particularly useful area, um, not even very attractive. Um, this is down, down state, in the middle of the state. As a beekeeper, I always look for where are the bees foraging? Well, you've got a tar road here. You've got a, a mowed area of grass, which hasn't got any wildflowers in it. You got your wheat stubble over here. There's actually, when you figure out how much of the state is in areas like this, there's nothing for really much of anything. This doesn't support a lot of wildlife. That doesn't, and that doesn't. So for a beekeeper, I look at that. Well, where are the bees foraging? They need to have pollen and nectar, and so do birds and other wildlife. This is just a kind of a sterile environment. And there's actually no need for this. Um, Texas and other states leave their wildflowers and let them grow. It's not essential to have this monoculture type thing going on. And then, of course, uh, heavily managed developments. This is up in, does anybody know where that is? It's up near the mall. Um, this, is, this has covered a lot of uh, northwest Arkansas. And um, again, here you have a large paved area. Then you have these little tiny areas of horticultural plants, most of which are no good for bees or wildlife. And then you have your housing. So when you cover a lot of the area in pavement, lawns, um, exotic plants, uh, you, you're not making a lot of habitat for wildlife. And then, uh, how about that? That's our big auto park. Now, we need these things. I mean, I, I bought our last car here. Um, but uh, they, you know, we put a lot of our, our territory into this kind of thing nationwide. And, um, and if you look at what plants they grow in these lawns, there's, there's not really a, a great deal there for animals. And this is up at the university campus. Um, and I consider lawns a big waste, frankly. Most of them, I think uh, we, should, we should remove a lot of lawns and put them into other things, like uh, tall grass prairies or prairie plants, um, and not mow them and not use fossil fuels to mow them, and have less lawn. I don't think there's any reason not to have lawn, but you don't need quite so much lawn. Now, I want to talk, I think, a little bit about insects. Um, one of the things I like to point out is that uh, insects are small. This is a honeybee. If you made an insect as big as us, if you made it as big as a grizzly bear or a human, they, you would notice them much more than you do. <laughs> you know, if you had a bald-faced hornet the size of one of us come in the room, you would notice it. Or a praying mantid, you would say, I, I understand it's an animal. They are animals just like us and have the same requirements as you and I do. Um, this just shows you again, though, they are small. This is one of my graduate students holding a dead bee, and they're not very big. Uh, they're actually a small animal size-wise, but very important animals. Um, this is a picture of the Ozarks in Arkansas. We are kind of blessed that we do have quite a bit of natural terrain left in Arkansas, uh, places where you know, the birds can nest uh, unmolested and um, insects can grow and reproduce. Uh, these are very important areas and we're lucky to have as much as we do. Now I want to go on a little tangent here and talk about the history of ideas. 
I, I think ideas are really important, um, but they often have a long gestation period. And two examples of this is slavery and the women's right to vote. If you think about it, um, from the first recordings of human history till 1833, slavery was accepted almost everywhere in the world. It was okay. People owned slaves. It was abolished in 1833, not that long ago in England. And then Abraham Lincoln freed about three million of our slaves in 1863, not that long ago. So it took like, you know, 5,000 years for this idea to take root that we shouldn't have slaves. Isn't that right? It's like now we sort of think we shouldn't have slaves. But for 5,000 or 6,000, maybe 10,000 years, humans thought that was okay. So that's a long gestation period. And unfortunately, even though uh, the idea has taken root primarily, it's, it's actually not eradicated. There's actually more slaves right now than there were back in the 1860s when we had slavery. They estimate there's 27 million slaves in the world right now. So not everybody holds this idea. If you go over to Sudan, uh, people might still believe that you can own a person. And um, there's lots of people still held in slavery. But the idea has taken root in many countries. Uh, suffrage for women, the right to vote, is also one. It wasn't granted until 1918 in, in, in the UK and 1920 in the United States. So there again is an idea that really is quite recent. It's only 90 years ago that women were deemed worthy of voting in our elections. For you know, quite a long time, women weren't considered able to vote. So there's an idea that had a long gestation period. So I think that ideas are really important, and I think it's time for us in Fayetteville and elsewhere to embrace a new idea uh, that the plants and animals of North America need our help and we can make a difference. And this is Doug Tallamy. Uh, he's a close friend of mine. I really like him as a person. He's a colleague, and I actually consider him a hero. He's chair of the entomology department at the University of Delaware. And he's come up with an idea. It's not all his idea. No idea comes from one person. The idea of women's vote didn't come from one person. The idea of no slavery didn't come from one person. And, and Doug has put together a lot of people's ideas on this, but he has put them together. So I really value that. And he wrote this book, uh, which is Bringing Nature Home, which if you haven't read, I really recommend you read it. Um, and it is a life changer. Uh, my wife and I have, have realized that, um, that there are plants which don't belong in our city and I think should be killed. <laughs> and there are plants which do belong and should be fostered. But I'm going to show you some pictures towards the end which show you what I mean. Um, anyway, I highly recommend it. If you haven't read it, get it and read it. I think he's coming back again this next year. He's an excellent speaker, an excellent person, really nice person, and very, uh, he's like a proselytizer. He's like Johnny Appleseed. He's going around the country promoting the idea of native plants. If you take his book and distill it down, here's what he says that insects are the base of the food chain for many birds and other wildlife, that plants are the base of the food chain for insects, and that exotic plants do not support the insect diversity and abundance that native plants support. This is very important. The horticultural industry has fostered plants which nothing eats. That's what they like because it doesn't look bad. The bugs don't get on it. The birds don't get on it. Nothing gets on it. And so half of our ecosystems are covered with plants nothing eats uh, that are good for wildlife. Um, we, as, as humans, have covered our continent with exotic plants, like cotton, like corn even. Corn doesn't really belong all over the place. It used to come from Mexico, uh, like soybeans. Uh, like, you know, these plants aren't native to the U.S., and we've covered the continent with them. And by doing that, we've reduced the abundance and diversity of insects, and therefore the birds and other animals. But we can positively change this by removing exotic plants, by choosing native plants, and by working to diversify the structure that benefit wildlife. And one of the main things I think that he, he, he feels is if we did this in all of our yards, that we would then create, in our urban yards and our urban parks, we would create the largest wildlife refuge in the world because they would all abut. If you took everybody in the United States did this, we would have this gigantic wildlife preserve. And so this is something each of us individually can do in our yards and our, the, the land we control. Let's talk a little about exotic organisms. These are non-native organisms. They weren't organisms which evolved in the new world. And uh, one thing I have to point out is everything, even bad things, have some value usually. Uh, but our concern here is with aggressive, invasive organisms. And we're currently being inundated by these. Uh, you could have a whole talk on just the new things we brought over to this country. Uh, Entomologists are fighting these everywhere. Um, hemlock trees are threatened by invasive pests. The hardwoods in the east are threatened. Um, we are just fighting as entomologists. All these things are coming in from China and other parts of the world. 
But I'll just go over a couple examples. Bermuda grass, starlings, Japanese beetles, and domestic cats. Okay, <laughs> probably some cat lovers here, but Bermuda grass. Uh, there's a lot of learning here, and I think if you learn, you, you, can, you can develop a plan. Uh, Bermuda grass is not native to the United States. It's native to Africa, Asia, and Australia. It's very fast growing, and it makes it very useful. So it's been planted a lot. But it's also considered highly aggressive, crowds out most other grasses, invades, and has become hard to eradicate. And it's considered a pest by a lot of people. And it's all over the place. Bermuda grass does not belong on this continent, really. And it's not easy to control it, and it has bad effects. Uh-oh. Darn it. I had a picture of a quail, and it doesn't show here. But the northern bobwhite quail have shown a 65% decline in their populations in the last few decades. And, and one reason for that is Bermuda grass. Uh, these the Bermuda grass pastures don't provide the structure that bobwhite quail need to live. And so we, we have a really, we're facing a major loss of bobwhite, and one reason is that there's so much Bermuda and fescue pasturage everywhere. Um, they just don't have the habitat that they need anymore which they did have in sort of tall grass prairie uh, situations. So Bermuda is not a good grass for wildlife, and this comes out of a bobwhite quail initiative. Um, for So it's an invasive species, it's exotic, doesn't belong here, and affects our quail populations. There's a lot of interesting things about these things, like European starlings, this is a picture I took just a couple days ago during the snowstorm, is native to Europe. It was released deliberately in 1890 in North America. About 60 to 100 birds were released by a guy named Eugene Schieffelin in Central Park, New York. He was president of this American Acclimatization Society, and their goal was to introduce every bird mentioned in Shakespeare to the United States. <laughs> okay, so he, he released 60 to 100 of these. We now have 200 million starlings in North America. And they don't belong here at all. They should be killed on site if there's any way to do it, but there's no good way to do it. Like the government does kill them. They said they killed a million of them last year, but a million doesn't mean anything when you have 200 million. They're a very aggressive bird. Um, gosh, okay. Uh, this illustrates one other point. I like, I like uh, some quotes. This one's by uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And he says, nothing is so terrible as activity without insight. So this guy who released the starlings was doing something called activity without insight. He thought he was doing a good thing. Let's make, let's make America into a replica of the UK. Let's have the birds of Shakespeare. But what he did actually was unleash a terrible pest on the United States. But um, and I'll talk briefly about another pest, um, is Japanese beetle, which I'm doing research on. It's also an exotic invasive species, which just recently invited uh, Arkansas about 15 years ago. And the grubs eat roots of grass, and the adults eat over 100 species of plants especially roses and grapes. So there's a picture of Japanese beetles. They like to gather on flowers and mate and eat. Now they are a severe invasive pest in themselves. And they're going to be hard to control. They're going to be here for a long time in Arkansas. And there's a grub from my research in a pot of soil. And actually starlings have a positive effect. They love to eat grubs. And you often see them in the yards uh, pulling up grubs and eating them. So starlings are not 100% bad. Um, probably the the Japanese beetle is 100% bad for our ecosystem. <laughs> but the starlings aren't. You know, they eat grubs. But, but on the whole, starlings don't belong here. For one reason, they are very aggressive to flickers and uh, purple martins and other birds. And they drive them out of their nest cavities. And I've actually observed this. Has anybody else ever observed a starling stealing a nest? They're amazing. They just take over. I saw some flickers nesting. They drove them out and took it over. And so um, these, these starlings are having a, a major effect on birds which are really valuable native birds like flickers. So overall, the starling should be eradicated, but there's probably no way to do so. Um, cats, uh, this is just an interesting one. Um, they also are exotic. Actually, cats come from Africa. Uh, it's, people estimate they kill 100. Some people estimate 500 million birds a year in the United States um, and a billion small mammals like chick, chipmunks. Um, and this is a really contentious story. People actually have been threatened if they suggest that cats be neutered. Or if people, bird lovers will suggest we neuter cats, and then cat lovers will actually threaten their lives. Uh, it's a very contentious thing, but cats are really, this is a flicker I saw that was caught by a cat, and um, the most popular pet in the world, and we've associated them for 10,000 years. But, but they are an exotic animal, a predator that really does not belong in the United States. People love their cats, but they don't really belong here and they're quite hard on our songbirds. Okay, now there are good exotic plants, and a good exotic plant is one that knows its place. 
Um, like I like peonies, and you won't see peonies spreading into like wildlife refuges. They just don't do that. You know, they sit where they're planted and they last and they provide. So there are plants like zinnias or, you know, there's lots of plants which are good and are exotic, but, but they stay in their place. The ones that are harmful are the ones that move all over the place and are uncontrolled. So the characteristics of a noxious plant or organism like the starling is they're aggressive and they're invasive and their negative aspects outweigh their positive value. Okay, this is just some more digression, but uh, this is one of my employees one year. And I put her next to her. I tried to make a cicada about the relative size to her. So, you know, humans are very self, uh, we're, we're really oriented towards humans, so we think we're important because we're big. Uh, but if, uh, if you take a cicada, it's pretty small. And a cicada is a big insect, actually. And then if you make the cicada the same size as a human, you start realizing, hey, it's, maybe it's pretty important. And then if you make the human the size of a cicada, then you start thinking, oh, well, actually, humans maybe aren't so important. Because uh, we put a lot of value on size. We think we're important because we're big. But cicadas are, 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 are important. They're smaller. OK. Uh, just a couple more digressions about bugs. This is a deferential grasshopper on my porch in, in Wilson Park. Uh, they're a very alert little insect. Most people think nothing of a grasshopper. Uh, I think they're really fascinating little creatures, little personality. And they are looking at me just like I'm looking at them. Uh, they have their own value. Uh, it's not for me to say that they have no value. And they actually are, uh, there's some slides in a minute that will show that they are valuable. Okay, so um, so talking about birds for a minute and insects. Uh, insects are the major source of protein for, for many, many types of birds. Even things like turkey chicks eat mostly bugs as, as when they're young. And there are hawks, which live almost entirely on bugs. And woodpeckers live about probably 99% on bugs. And all these other things depend on insects for food. Um, it's, it's, they're incredibly important to birds, if you like birds. And there's even a book by Gilbert Walbar, an entomologist at Illinois, just on birds and bugs. Um, if you ever watch nestling songbirds, their mouths are open the entire time, and the, the parents are having to find bugs all the time and stuff them down their mouths. If you don't have caterpillars and other insects, these nestlings do not do well. Um, these are not my, that was my picture, but these ones aren't. But this is like a picture of, of, a, of a bluebird feeding a bug. Um, a tree swallow, things like tree swallows depend almost 100% on insects. No, tree, no bugs, no tree swallows. And it's true for purple martins, uh, barn swallows, all the swallows. Tree swifts. Uh, night hawks are bug feeders. That's what they eat. They go way up high in the sky and they catch moths and other insects that are floating around and flying in the sky. These, these birds are 100% dependent on insects. Uh, scissor tailed flycatchers. Um, wrens, this was in my backyard, but if you watch the wrens, they are going back every couple of minutes and finding another bug. Uh, so the abundance of these insects is what Doug Tallamy says is terribly important. Uh, these are tree swallows that died because there weren't enough bugs. If, if they don't have enough insects, they won't survive. Um, there are specialists in Europe and Africa which eat nothing but bees, and they're really beautiful birds. These are European bee eaters. And even in the United States, there's a bird called the uh, summer tanager. And I wrote an article about summer tanagers eating honeybees. If you look, this one's got a honeybee. They'd come and set up next to my beehives and catch the bees in flight and eat them. So summer tanagers are uh, uh, called by bee eaters by some people. So uh, birds and insects are intimately linked. Even things like the kingfisher are, are closely linked to insects. They eat fish, but fish in streams often eat insects. So here's a trout. And they're pointing out that they eat crustacea, like uh, crayfish. And I can't see this thick picture very much, but they say uh, mayfly, stonefly, nymphs, caedus fly. You know, there's an interaction between these things. The minnows are eating insects, and then the, the birds are eating the fish. So there's a Dobson fly larva, or helgramite, which is a stream insect in Arkansas. Um, caedus fly larvae live in these cases and streams. Uh, these are all food for fish, which then the kingfisher eats. <coughs> Just a couple of pictures to show you. The, the truth is, the, the, the selection pressure on caterpillars and other insects is very intense from birds. Um, they've developed many strategies to try to be avoid predation, including crypsis, poisonings, uh, warnings, spines, hair, and so on. I'll show you a couple of pictures. This is a, uh, a viceroy caterpillar. Probably some of you know the viceroy. It's a monarch mimic. The adult looks just like a monarch. The, the larva here is eating on willow. And when you first look at them, if you don't look at them very carefully, uh, they look just like a bird dropping. And the birds don't see them because they look like a bird dropping. There's lots of caterpillars that mimic bird droppings. 
Then there's, uh, there's a tiger swallowtail caterpillar. A lot of swallowtail larvae look like bird droppings at some stages. And then they also often develop these fake eye spots. Their real eyes are right here, little tiny, small, tiny eyes. These are fake eyes, which make them look a little like a snake. And um, a lot of the swallowtails do this. And then they also have these smelly osmeteria to deter predation. So there's all kinds of things that insects are doing. This is a limacoded or a slug caterpillar. This is a monkey slug caterpillar here in Arkansas. And these ones produce all kinds of urticating hair. So if a bird eats it, it gets all these really uh, horrible hairs down its throat. Uh, this is not that new, all this stuff. I mean, Rachel Carson wrote about this, the interaction between uh, pesticides and loss of birds. Um, you know, we're still facing this for different reasons now, maybe development. And um, this is a more recent book called The Silence of the Songbirds. And another philosophical point I wanted to point out is that extinction, there's two types of extinction. There's, there's an ultimate extinction where there's absolutely nothing left of a species, like the dodo bird. There are no dodo birds left on Earth. Um, they are extinct. But this fellow, Michael uh, Robert Pyle, had another thing called the extinction of experience. He says that's a decline not only of endangered species, but, but of areas so we don't see these things anymore. He says, suppose a creature dies out within your radius of reach, the area to which you have easy access. In some respects, it might as well as be gone altogether because you will not be able to see it as you could before. And that's true. If you, if you grow in an, in an area where you never see bluebirds, for you, they're sort of extinct, even though they might exist someplace else. So that's another whole aspect of um, extinction, is that we want these things to be available for children and people to, to see and enjoy. Now, this is actually a true story um, of the Swainson's hawk. Uh, I didn't know much about the Swainson's hawk, but uh, the Swainson's hawk lives in our prairies. It's not common around here, but it lives in our prairies. And its primary food is grasshoppers. And it migrates from our prairie areas down through Central America down to Argentina. And in 1995, a researcher was studying Swainson's hawks and found that farmers in Argentina were spraying their sunflowers with a chemical pesticide to control grasshoppers. And this, the, grass, the, the Swainson's hawks would then eat these grasshoppers that were killed. And at least 20,000 hawks had been killed, which is a large number of hawks that migrate. So this is an interaction between insects, grasshoppers, and hawks, farmers, and pesticides, and bird declines. So uh, the point of this is that abundant, high quality, clean insect prey are essential for many bird populations. This is an example of a true life example where pesticides were resulting in large numbers of migratory birds being killed. Uh, this is a picture from that Silence of the Songbirds. It just shows the, uh, the pesticide sales in um, Central America uh, over time. And you can see it's up around a uh, billion and a half dollars or so now. The pesticide use is climbing greatly in a lot of these countries. And when it climbs, they, they're used primarily to kill things like insects, which then result in uh, loss of food for birds and also direct kills of birds. So the Swains and Hawks story teaches us the following, that the abundance of insect prey or declines in insect prey affect bird numbers, that pesticides used for insect control can cause bird mortality and declines, either through poisoning or indirectly by reducing insect numbers, and that migratory birds are exposed to these risks throughout their journey. So the Swainson Hawk is exposed to these problems all the way from the United States down to Argentina. And then it comes back up to the US. But OK, so now let's praise little brown moths. Uh, Noctuidae primarily, it probably doesn't mean too much to you. There's, there's a very large Noctuid that comes into the US sometimes called the Black Witch. That's it there. Um, that's the biggest one. And then there's lots of them that we do know of, like the underwings. But most of these are medium-sized, robust drab moths like the corn earworm. And as I mentioned before, it used to be that we produced vast numbers of these moths. And they would fly around at night and serve as food for, for wildlife like night hawks and bats. And here's an example of that. The Mexican free-tailed bats and noctuid moths, each night, they estimate that 100 million Mexican free-tailed bats in South Central Texas must eat 1,000 tons or 2 million pounds of insects per night. That's a lot of moths. But we've make, we're making it so that our, even our cropland isn't producing these moths anymore by using these genetically altered plants. I actually would like to write an article, article on this, but I haven't quite figured out how. The insects eaten are billions of corn earworm moths, beet armyworm moths, fall armyworm moths, all noctuids. 
So these, these moths, these populations are very important for wildlife, but we're working terribly hard to eliminate them totally because we don't want them eating our crops. The source for this was National Geographic. Now, I want to switch to, to pollinators for a few seconds. This is a honeybee gathering pollen from hellebore in my front yard. And um, honeybees and other bees are hairy insects which are designed to collect pollen. That's what they're designed to do. They're, these hairs are branched and, and if you look at them under the microscope, there's little branched hairs collect pollen. So they're actually pollen collecting animals and they have these special rakes and combs on their hind legs to rake pollen off of their hairs. You can collect this, oops, you can collect this pollen in a pollen trap. This is what it looks like when you collect it off the bees. A very nutritious uh, source of food, actually, for humans. Um, and the pollination services of insects are valued at about $14 billion a year. That's the main value of honeybees. It's not honey. It's pollination uh, for agricultural products and wild plants. Um, if you look at these pollen balls from a bee's leg, closer you can see different colors representing different plant species they've gathered from. If you look up closer, you can see the little individual pollen grains or the male sex cells of the plant, which make up a pollen ball. So this is very essential for cross-pollination of plants. Um, in things like the almond orchards in California, there were like 600,000 acres of almonds in 2007. It's actually a, another big monoculture. There's nothing there except for almond trees for bees. Uh, every almond that is produced has a bee pollinator. Every time you eat an almond, a bee pollinated that plant. A million of our honeybee colonies go to California every year to pollinate the almond groves. So every almond, a bee uh, pollinated that flower. And the same is true for apples. If you don't have pollinators, especially bees, you don't have apples. Strawberries, uh, again, here's what strawberries look like when they're pollinated. If they're not pollinated adequately, you get a strawberry like this. So all of these farmers know you have to have bees, and honeybees are traditionally still the ones that they use to import to pollinate their crops. So pollinators are very important for both domestic farm products but also wildlife. And one thing a lot of people don't realize is there are many native bees. Uh, the honeybee is actually an exotic organism itself. It came from Europe and Africa. Uh, we have many, many species and genera of, of native bees generally called solitary bees, helictids, megachylid, leafcutters, Osmia, they're all hairy, all vegetarian uh, feeders on pollen. And you can have an effect on them, even any of us can. You can improve the, the, the populations of these by putting up um, artificial housing for uh, these solitary bees. They nest in these holes and the, the female bees will take up homes there and, and reproduce. Uh, bumblebees are another example of native bees uh, which are considered in decline and they nest in old mouse nests. Uh, and they feed their young in these circular spherical cells in the larvae are within there. I'm not going to go into bee biology, but you can also buy bumblebee boxes and try to foster bumblebees because they also are in decline. Okay, so now I want to talk about what we can do to help insects and birds in Fayetteville. Okay. Uh, the first thing I think is uh, we should eliminate invasive exotic plants that don't provide much benefit to insects or wildlife. And I actually do, I recommend, now I've, it's taken me years to realize this, but I, I think that all the Bradford pears should be removed from the state. <laughs> I do. I think all the bush honeysuckles, I never, I grew up in a state where there was lots of bush honeysuckle. I thought it was a native plant. It is not native. It's terribly invasive. Um, I'll talk about that for a minute. Multiflora rose is another exotic, doesn't belong here. It's terribly invasive. Privet is very invasive, English ivy is very invasive, and kudzu, and there's probably other ones. I think Bermuda grass, but that's impossible to get rid of, I think. Um, and I think they should be replaced with native species like hollies, dogwoods, pawpaw, sassafras, and spice bush. Um, there's just a lot of things which we could use in place of these. Um, so I'll start out. This is, uh, anybody recognize that spot? Well, they're all gone now, which is good. But those are Bradford pears in bloom. And uh, they were promoted by horticulturists as a good plant to put in, in our yards and town. And they are kind of pretty superficially um, when they're in bloom. But uh, I've never seen, people tell me that bees gather from them. I've never seen a bee on them, ever. I don't think they do actually gather any pollen or nectar from them. 
and the birds don't seem to eat their fruit particularly. That's my impression. I could be wrong. Somebody might correct me. But um, their, we their wood is weak, um, and they've taken them all out of there. And there's still some more by the pool. I, I hope they'll take all of them out and replace them with something better for wildlife. And they, they, they came from China. My feeling is they don't belong here. Um, and this is one of ones I really didn't know about when I was a kid. I used to see these all the time. This is one of the bush honeysuckles. Uh, they say birds eat these things, but I don't think birds really like them too much. But they do spread their seeds. And this is the, I, I'd say this is the number one invasive plant in Fayetteville right now. It, you, if you walk along the railroad tracks, you walk through Wilson Park, you can easily count thousands and thousands of bush honeysuckles. They also are not from the US, they're from Asia. Um, I have never seen, they produce a flower, I've never seen a bee or a butterfly on those plants. I never see caterpillars on them. So they don't produce caterpillars for birds, they don't produce nectar and pollen for bees, and they aren't the best bird food, and they're terribly invasive. I'm not kidding you, we should form a crew and go along the railroad tracks and pull them all up and put something else in there. They are everywhere. I went to the Cornell's Laboratory of Ornithology, and the whole area was covered up with, with bush honeysuckles. They, there's other plants which are better. Um, and this just, I took this walk today with my wife. This is along the path um, coming up to campus, the, the sidewalk paths, which are very nice in, in Fayetteville. This doesn't show very well, but if, everywhere you look, there's these bush honeysuckles everywhere. And uh, its species name is Lanicera tatarica. And um, I guarantee you there are 10,000 of these things or more in our area. And they are very invasive, uh, don't belong here. Um, this is Multiflora Rose. This also was introduced from China and Japan in 1866 in the United States. The U.S. government promoted it as living fences and gave out free plants everywhere. It's now recognized it as unstoppable growth. Um, it has a habit of forming impenetrable thickets that exclude native plants. The fruits are dispersed widely by birds. They say one plant may produce a million seeds per year that can remain viable in the soil for 20 years. It has these very sharp recurved thorns on it. Uh, it's becoming a major problem in the Northeast. It does produce berries. It is kind of pretty, pretty but this gets back to this point that it's, 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 it's harmful aspects outweigh its good aspects. It's, it's really a dangerous plant. Um, it's, there's a lot of it in Fayetteville and this area. And my wife and I have been trying to remove it from a property out in West Fork. It's, it's major work to try to get rid of it. And it's, it's all over the place. And um, the government now recognizes it's a severe invasive exotic pest. It does have some positive things. Birds like to eat it, but the negatives outweigh the positive. Uh, kudzu, we've all seen some kudzu around here. There was some down in Wilson Park even. Um, uh, that was introduced in the U.S. in Japan, from Japan in 1876. They say it's spreading at a rate of 150,000 acres a year. And it does this kind of thing. It completely covers trees and um, inundates the, uh, the area with these vines. So, so these, this characteristic of being invasive is serious. Um, it, these things actually, there's uses of kudzu even, but its invasiveness way outweighs its uses. So that also should be killed. If you have some, you should kill it. You should just say it's too noxious to allow it to grow, in my opinion. Now this is a picture of my backyard in fall 2010. Like, like there are plants which, I don't know why we didn't plant them to begin with. This is a robin. I, they came, big flocks of robins came through and were eating um, berries on my dogwood, and there's one eating it. Um, and, uh, you know, dogwood is a native plant, and it produces berries that the uh, birds love. And uh, it doesn't, it's not terribly invasive. And I would say that's a good replacement for bush honeysuckle um, or some of these other plants. And another one is hollies. Hollies are great birds, berries for birds. This is robins eating berries in my next door neighbor's yard. Um, we see lots of birds in there, robins, bluebirds, cedar, waxwings, uh, flocking to eat holly. Um, there's plants which are not native to Fayetteville, which I think are really good for bees, like Mahonia is not real invasive, and it produces flowers that the bees like right now, and it produces berries which the birds eat later in the, in the, in the summer. Um, Cornelian cherry is not native, it's China but it's uh, not invasive and the bees love Cornelian cherry. It's a dogwood. That's in Wilson Park. And then the other thing I think people should do is, um, I actually think people should replace their lawns or large parts of their lawns with native grass prairies if, if possible. This is Baker Prairie in Harrison, Arkansas and it's absolutely beautiful. And there's quail up there and wildlife uh, and it's, a, it's really much prettier than any fescue or Bermuda grass lawn. 
So I think using native grass, grasses and wildflowers are a good alternative. And this is a split beard blue stem um, up like near Lake Fayetteville. They're beautiful plants in themselves and I think could replace a lot of lawn unless you really need something for croquet or something. <laughs> okay, the last things I'm going to talk about are like monarchs. Um, these are mating monarchs uh, out at the research farm where I work. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that every insect has the same requirements that you do. It needs water, it needs food, it needs to mate, it needs to have a habitat. And these are mating monarchs prior to going down to Mexico. They're on Budlia, uh, which is a nice plant. It's a very good nectar source in the fall. I don't think Budlia is native um, to the U.S., but I can't remember for sure. But it is a good source of nectar for the migrating mon monarchs. And that's another thing to try to plant for is that butterflies have sources of nectar and bees do. Uh, the whole population of monarchs in the east go down to certain sites in Mexico, and they come from vast distances. They have to fly down there, and they have to stop all along the way and get nectar so that they can make it to Mexico. Um, other things you can do to benefit uh, caterpillars like monarchs is to plant native milkweeds, uh, which are, will definitely attract monarchs and give them the larvae a place to uh, feed. Uh, if you haven't ever seen a monarch pupa, it's a beautiful thing in itself. Um, they're really quite dramatic. Uh, and these are overwintering monarchs in, in Mexico. But all these monarchs came from North America and flew thousands of miles to get there and need to refuel along the way. I, I, I like to look at it like this. It's like when you go on a long trip, if you run out of gas stations, you're going to run out of gas. And same with these butterflies. They can't go for hundreds of miles without a nectar. So if you can plant fall blooming nectar plants for the monarchs that will really help them on their trip down to Mexico. Oh, just because I'm an entomologist, I can throw a couple more. These are native insects I really love. These are Cecropia moths. They're native to the United States. If you plant their native, the plants that they eat, they will possibly have a place to live. They're really beautiful on themselves. And that's a, a, mono, I mean, a, a morning, sorry, a, a Cecropia moth in my backyard. These are native insects. They only live a week as an adult. They're very beautiful. They don't eat anything as adults. Um, but if you don't plant their, their host plants, they can't survive. Well, they eat things like apple, uh, which is not native to the U.S., but they also eat um, willow. Uh, a lot of, they have fairly high Y host range. These are relatives of them, Promethea moths. These are also in my backyard. This is the female. This is the male. They're sexually dimorphic in their mating. Um, and they eat sassafras. So if you want those, you have to have sassafras. And you don't want, you know, bush honeysuckle, you know. But these are really beautiful native moths to Arkansas and the United States and um, are worth, they're really important parts of our wildlife. And then the luna moth, they feed on walnut and hickory as larvae and the adults like the other Saturnids don't feed at all. Um, and so these are native moths and they're not going to feed on uh, non-native plants. And um, I also, this is a, a white line sphinx moth. They feed on lots of different uh, weeds and small herbs. But um, uh, this is my front yard in Fayetteville. Uh, these are beautiful moths and uh, a lot of people try to kill their tomato hornworms which are related to these. Uh, I think you need to leave areas for these things to survive as pupae and let them eat um, even things like your tomatoes. Uh, things like, things like um, the Red Admiral, another native butterfly, only eats nettles. So if there's no nettles, there are no Red Admirals. So this gets back to butterfly gardening, which is another principle. But you have to have the host plants for the larvae and then nectar sources for the adults. Uh, and then things like the zebra swallowtail, which is a beautiful southern butterfly, it has a one host plant, and that's a pawpaw, which is native to Arkansas. So instead of planting the exotic plants, um, Try to plant uh, native plants like pawpaw, and then you'll have caterpillars, and then you may also have other native insects that the birds can eat. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I, I think we can make Fayetteville richer in birds, butterflies, and other wildlife by removing the exotic plants like bush honeysuckle uh, and replacing them with native plants or non-invasive exotic plants that, that provide something for wildlife. I think we can reduce our lawns and replace them with wildflowers and native grasses. I don't say get rid of your lawn totally, but reduce it and structure for pupae and wildlife to survive. And when we do this, we create uh, small wildlife preserves uh, all across the country. And Talamy thinks if we all work together, we create the world's largest wildlife preserve if we did this 
in Fayetteville, and everybody else did it in the other cities around the country. So I brought some books along to show you. If you haven't seen them, uh, this is Peterson's first guide to caterpillars. Caterpillars are beautiful animals in themselves. A lot of people don't know that. That's a good little cheap book. There's a great book by David Wagner on caterpillars of the United States. This is a terrific book. He's one of the world experts on Lepidoptera. But you can identify almost any caterpillar you'll ever find with this book. And they're as diverse as all the butterflies and as pretty. Um, then Lori Spencer, one of our students, uh, wrote a book called but Arkansas Butterflies and Moths. It's a good book. Um, and then, of course, Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home. Uh, definitely a must book for anybody interested in nature, wildlife, and gardens. Yeah, I'm not saying people should get rid of their entire lawns. What I don't like to go is I drive along and I'll see these like three acre lawns with nothing in it, just grass. And those grasses aren't even often native. And then they use chemlon and they kill all the grubs, the few insects that were there are being killed. So you have this sterile environment. I don't think that's worthwhile. It's not even attractive in my eyes. I think you should put it in fruit trees or, you know, even, even apple trees and things provide something for wildlife. Uh, flowers provide nectar for pollinators. Um, that's just my opinion. I think there's way too much grass. Uh, I see it all, all over the place. I think native grass prairies, tall grass prairies would be, you know, much more attractive and less, maybe less input if once you can get them established. They're hard to get established, but um, I think they're much more valuable.